now. Uh, it's the time for questions. Would you have any questions? Uh, kindly introduce yourself before you speak and tell whom you are asking the question of. I have a request from Mrs. Makoko. In the expectation of increase of violence in the run-up to the next presidential elections, does your NGO foresee a change in reporting, monitoring, um, make this information available only on demand? How do you um, expect um, the situation to be um, in the coming, um, for the next presidential uh, elections? And this question is coming from Jana Baverova. Hello? I think in the next election, we intend to continue okay. monitoring and documenting around political violence. And we do not make this information available on demand. We now have a website and we will be uploading our reports on the website for everybody to see what will be happening. Okay, uh, there's another question for you. Um, uh, about the number of people and the situation of people who are um, obliged to leave Zimbabwe, actually, as a consequence of their of the political violence a, and economical um, situation. situation, I suppose. Yeah. Do you um, have details about that and figures? I do have a rough idea in terms of the number of people that have been forced to leave the country uh, because of the economic situation and also the political situation. I think the count at the moment could be in the region of 3.5 million Zimbabweans who are in the diaspora. Um, people are in South Africa, Botswana, and we have also a large number of people who are in the United Kingdom, the US, and uh, every other part of the world that you can think of. But I think the greater concentration of people are in South Africa and the United Kingdom. Thank you. I have now a question for Mr. Michel Pranduc. Um, how can we help the Vietnamese position? Should we boycott Vietnamese products? Bonjour. Merci. Thank you. Well, at the present time, the Vietnamese uh, political opposition is gagged. But there is an effort, a try to ask an attempt to ask for a greater democracy in the country. Through This has help, been helped by the Arab Revolution. So the first thing you can do is to talk with people around you. For many countries, it's a very calm country. Vietnam seems not to have any problems. So you have to talk about it and say that there are dissidents uh, who are languishing in prison. And we must have break the wall of silence uh, and shed light on what is happening. It is h hard for the dissidents to feel that they're alone when they're in their cells. Now, I've left documents here with the names of uh, people who are prisoners of constant consciences at conscience, and I've left their address. You can write them. You can write politicians about them and may name these uh, figures. There are people in the West who have gone, political figures who have gone to Vietnam to meet with these dissidents and their families. And this is a very positive sign of support. Now, concerning boycotts, so this is uh, rather tricky. We boycott because we want to punish the regime, but we shouldn't boycott because of people who work in these uh, areas. Some people can be boycotted. Uh, some of the products made 
by uh, small, but it's the big enterprises, yes, but not the small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, that's census. Now, we think that one of the things that we can do as tourists is not just follow the normal tourist circus, um, see what they want to show you, but we should go beyond this and see what's happening behind the scenes and talk to people. I think people are very hungry for change and want to express themselves. They want to hear about what's happening outside and to cast a fresh eye on what's going on in the country and to hear what's happening outside. But is it possible for people to do this and to talk with the population? Is it possible? Aren't the people under surveillance? Don't they run a risk if they talk with uh, tourists? Well, there are a lot of tourists, so the regime can't keep an eye on everybody. There are official circuits of tourism, but people can leave these circuits, and we often uh, offer the possibility to certain political figures to take different routes. We can do this discreetly without uh, uh, drawing the attention of the authorities. If you're a tourist, you could uh, talk with the people around you. There's no problem in that, on that level. And then even you can uh, speak on behalf of somebody who wants to complain about the regime. That depends on whom you end up talking to, but you, you can ha enter into contact with people who are not officially on your tourist uh, route itinerary. Ms. Pan? Um, will current people have candidates in the April Burma election? Um, as I understand, the Karan National Union, which is the main pro-democracy um, Karan resistance um, group, doesn't have any plan to participate in the upcoming by-elections, but there are, might be small political parties who are under the administrations of the dictatorship. But even though if these um, small parties won the elections, in spite of uh, lots of restrictions and censorship and security laws, uh, there will be very little chance for them to make a difference within the parliament because Basically, the parliament was set up by the dictatorship, and it was um, after the 2010 elections, and the parliament was powerless and f very much dominated by military-backed political parties and MPs. And the main problem with this parliament is the constitutions, because like every house, you have a strong foundations and frames to keep it strong, and for Burma, to legalize and strengthen military rule. It is the constitution which is the foundation of these military rules, but in civilian guise. And these constitutions doesn't guarantee any democracy and human rights for the people of Burma. That's why many oppositions uh, movements um, disagree with these constitutions, and I strongly disagree with these constitutions, especially when it is a death sentence for ethnic diversities in Burma, where it doesn't guarantee a federal democratic equal opportunity self-determination for ethnic people. And uh, based on the constitution, above the parliament, there is a president, and that means the parliament is very powerless, and above the president, there is a council called National Defense and Security Council. And within its 11 members of the council, 10 members are from military background, current military personnel or ex-military people. And above this council, there is military, the Burmese army. So the Burmese army still holds absolute power over the parliament, the president, and this National Defense and Security Council. So this is very unlikely that the by-elections in coming April will make much difference for the people in Burma. So also, there have been several questions also about uh, the role of the international community and also the fact that uh, now, I mean, you have the Human Rights Council taking place here in Geneva, not very far from here. 
And um, my question goes to the three of you, and uh, there are two questions coming also from the public, asking, first of all, what should be the role of the international community, uh, particularly maybe in the, in the three countries that sometimes the uh, international community is enlightening certain progress when in reality, as you told us, things are not really changing in the field. And secondly, what would be the role of the Human Rights Council? What are you expecting from the Human Rights Council? So maybe I'll ask to you, Zoya, first. Yeah. Yes, um, there has been some sanctions from international community when it comes to human rights violations going on in Burma. And uh, there are a mixture. Uh, the US has very strong sanctions on Burma. Um, including sanctions on financial transactions and imports and exports and some sanctions from the Canadian government and some small sanctions from Australian government and some uh, s weak sanctions from the European Union. And that's because EU has 27 member states and when it comes to the foreign policy, it's took only one country to say no, and then it, uh, it doesn't get strong sanctions from the European Union because we know Germany, Spain, Austria, and a few other countries who are very keen to do business uh, with the dictatorship in Burma, and they are not really deciding their foreign policy based on human rights and the principle of democracy. But there are some uh, strong countries like Czech Republic, the UK and Ireland and a few others who are strong on the, their principle on human rights and democracy in Burma. And when they come together at the European Union, their positions uh, has been watered down by German government and others. So, so far we know that um, governments, some governments in European Union want to relax sanctions because they they feel like they want to encourage reform in Burma, which we can understand, and this is what people in Burma uh, want genuine reform, not just on the surface, long-lasting peace and genu genuine reform. But so far, we haven't been there yet. We are just in the beginning of a long way to walk. Aung San Suu Kyi herself said, we are just at the beginning for a long, long, long way to walk. So what we want international community to do is to maintain these sanctions because it is working. And what the government in Burma is now doing, releasing some political prisoners and opening up some political space for the opposition, the NLD, and starting to put effort to have ceasefire with ethnic armed groups, it is because of international sanctions and because of pressure from within the country. It's not because they care about human rights, democracy, and the right things to do. So international pressure is very, very important to us. So please keep this pressure until we have genuine peace in Burma and we have durable and long-lasting peace for all the people in Burma. And we would like to see UN Human Rights Council to be strong on the situation in Burma, to condemn the human rights violations that has been taking place. And just a um, few months ago, a 12 year years old boy from Kachin State in northern part of Burma, he had to, to dig up his mother's body because his mother was shot dead by the Burmese army and dumped her body just like that. And a 24 years old teacher in Kachin State, she was four months pregnant and she was shot dead by the Burmese army. And again, last week in Karan State in Eastern Burma, a 22 years old woman faced attempted rape by the Burmese army soldiers. And there are still numerous human rights violations in Burma. 50,000 people have been displaced in the past years because of the increase of the attack by the Burmese army soldiers. And we have half a million people are internally displaced or hiding in the jungle without proper food and proper shelters. 
and millions of people from Burma are exiled and are um, forced to flee from their homelands. We just want to go home. I want to go home, but I can't. That's why we are here to ask the Human Rights Council to condemn the human rights violations happening in Burma and to continue your strong uh, pressure on the military-backed government in Burma. Thank you, Zoya. Thank you so much. Um, Monsieur. So, uh, Michel, uh, quel est votre, uh, votre avis concernant what is your view on the role of the international community can play and the Human Rights Council that is taking place right now in Geneva? Well, to begin with, I totally endorse what Zoya had said. International pre pressure does work. It has to be constant and strong and uh, ongoing. For example, in November, last November, uh, my friend's uh, sentence was considerably shortened, and now he's out of prison. So you have to keep the pressure up for a long time and make it strong so that people will be able to leave prison. Now, concerning the Human Rights Council, as I said, uh, we, you, Vietnam has applied for the council in uh, for 2014-16. Now, it's just like asking a thief to join the police. Now, if the thief has amended, why not? Uh, and the police wants to take him. But that's not the case of Vietnam, I believe. Uh, if they want to repent and stop the violations, okay. But for the time being, they have no place on that council. Now, the council should uh, point a finger to all those and accuse all those who are violating uh, human rights. Uh, the work, working group on uh, detentions uh, did do this. They did point a figure and uh, talk about people who need to be freed. And so people need to be freed. We should point out all the violations, all the abuses of uh, authority that uh, have been taking place in Vietnam. And there are there are millions of in funding to help improve the Vietnamese uh, political, cultural, legal system uh, that is being sent in by Europe. And this money must truly be used to help the country move uh, forward, and not only to line the pockets of those who are in power. Uh, on the international community, how c can the international community help your country and what you defending and also about the um, UN uh, Human Rights Council? Um, okay, I'll tackle the Human Rights Council one first. And um, I think what really needs to be done by the Human Rights Council um, is that Zimbabwe appeared at the Human Rights Council in October and there is a raft of uh, recommendations that they accepted. I think it is now the task of the Human Rights Council to follow up to see if these um, uh, recommendations are being implement implemented. And I think it is also important to, uh, for the Human Rights Council to insist on the visits of rapporteurs because our record has not been good in the past. But I remember that the minister actually said when he presented Zimbabwe's report that rapporteurs are uh, free to come and visit Zimbabwe. I think they need to test the waters and we need to be seeing this happening when they come on fact-finding missions. And like I said, in terms of the international community, I think it depends on uh, situation to situation. In some situations, it does work. As I can testify that in my case, I believe that the international pressure that was applied on the government did work to my advantage. But I think we have also seen in some instances where international pressure actually works the opposite. So it needs to be considered from situation to situation. And we are aware that we have some leaders in Zimbabwe who are on um, the targeted sanctions imposed by the EU and um, recently some of them have been removed 
from, from that list. And um, I think especially because a lot of people were recognizing that the implementation of the global political agreement was being stalled because ZANU-PF was insisting that those sanctions need to be removed um, first. So I think it is important that situations are considered uh, in the manner that they happen and individually considered by the international community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to conclude our panel. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for having come here to speak of their situation. They are available if you so wish. For any further questions uh, that you might have uh, later on, and we hope that you will talk about them and talk about their positions to help the, position, the situation in their respective countries improve. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panel of speakers and to Catherine for moderating.